So welcome back. This is going to be our second screencast for Chapter 19. And in this particular screencast, we are going to focus on the class Arachnida. Now, when you talk about arachnids, we're talking about animals such as spiders. We could be talking about scorpions. And we could also be talking about uh, mites and ticks. Now, these animals are going to be divided into two tagmata. And what we mean by tagmata, if you recall from our last video, is simply the way the body is going to be divided. And so when you're talking about arachnids, you're talking about an animal that has a cephalothorax. And you can see the cephalothorax identified right here. And you're talking about an animal that has an abdomen. So they have two primary body parts. Now sometimes what we do is we give special names to each of these areas. So if you're talking about a cephalothorax, you might see it referred to as a prosoma. And if you're talking about the abdomen, you might see it referred to as the opisthosoma. Now, the cephalothorax is going to bear a pair of chelicera. You can see the chelicera right here. So they're basically on the most anterior part of the animal. You're going to see a pair of pedipalps right here. And most of these animals will have four pairs of walking legs. Now, when you talk about arachnids, you're not talking about animals that have antenna, and also these animals do not have mandibles. Now, most of these animals will be considered predators, and so they have either claws, fangs, if they do have fangs, possibly poison glands, or they could possibly have stingers, depending on the type of arachnid we're referring to. Now, most of them do have sucking mouth parts to help them ingest fluids or any type of soft tissue from the bodies of their prey. And if we're talking specifically about spiders, these animals do have silk glands. Now, the males, sometimes, when you refer to their pedipalps, sometimes the males have these, um, what they considered modified pedipalps. And what they use these pedipalps for is to actually transfer sperm to the female. So they're used a little bit differently than they would normally be used in um, the females. Now, there's about 80,000 species of arachnids that have been discovered up to this point. Now, most of the arachnids are considered harmless to humans, but there definitely are many of them out there that do provide some essential control of um, different types of insects in our environments. Now, as I had said, when we talk about arachnids, there's different groups of arachnids. And so the first order we're going to look at is the order Arania. And these are specifically going to be the spiders. Now, there's about 40,000 species of spiders, and the body consists of an unsegmented cephalothorax, and we've already mentioned this, also sometimes called the prosoma, and an abdominal region, sometimes called the opistosoma. And you can see these labeled right down here. Now, they're going to be joined by a very slender pedicel. And so the pedicel, which isn't identified here, is going to be right here in this area. Now, the anterior appendages are going to be a pair of chelicera with terminal fangs. Now, the word terminal means the fangs are going to be located at the end. And so this right here is actually the chelicera, and of course, you can see the very large fangs in this representation of a spider. Now, the pair of pedipalps um, that you would find in these animals, which are located right here, these are going to be used as either a sensory type of organ or again, as we had said before, if they're being used by the male, they might be used to transfer sperm to the female during reproduction. Now, the basal parts of these pedipalps are going to be used to handle food. So sometimes they sort of use these pedipalps almost like hands to manipulate their prey. Now, there's four pairs of walking legs, like we had said before, and sometimes these walking legs will terminate with claws. As we had said, a lot of the arachnids are predaceous, and in fact, when you talk about the order Arania, all of these are predaceous, and most of them will feed on insects. Now, when you're talking about spiders, they tend to inject their venom into their prey, and what it's going to do is it's going to liquefy and basically digest the tissue um, of the animal. And as it digests the tissue of the animal, it's going to turn that tissue into um, a fluid, and that fluid is going to be sucked into the spider's stomach. Now, most of these animals will respire via book lungs and or trachea. So there actually are some members of Arania that have both types of respiratory organs. Now, they have parallel air pockets that are going to extend into the blood-filled chamber. So looking down here, you can get a good idea as to where these book lungs are that we had just mentioned and possibly the trachea. Um, in this particular case, you can see the book lungs being represented right here. And I don't believe in this particular sketch they identify any trachea, but as we had said before, some of them do have that. But as we had said, parallel air pockets are going to extend into a blood-filled chamber, and the air is actually going to enter that chamber through a slit in the body wall. And oftentimes what they do is they refer to that slit as a spiracle, so it's kind of the opening to the respiratory system. 
Now the trachea system is going to transport air directly to tissues if the animal does have that system. Now when it comes down to their excretory system, they have things called malpighian tubules. And you can see the malpighian tubules right here. So the yellow structure right through here is going to be their excretory structure. So it's going to be a way for them to get rid of waste. Now again, in addition to waste, there's going to be potassium and maybe some other types of solutes or maybe solidified material that they're going to be basically secreted into these tubules in order to possibly release them into the environment. Now there are some special excretory organs called rectal glands which will actually reabsorb some of these essential minerals that maybe the animal needs. And so if they're sort of lacking, for example, potassium, they definitely don't want to remove that from their body and so they're going to do their best to retain that. And so in this case, the rectal glands are going to work to retain the potassium and of course we don't want them to dehydrate so they're going to retain the water as well. And what this essentially does is it leaves the, what we would consider the pure waste material for the animal to excrete into its environment. Now one of the things of course that these um, organs will do is it's going to help the animal to conserve water. And when it does that, it's going to allow the animal to actually inhabit some really dry environments such as deserts. Now some spiders will have things called coxal glands. And these are, again are going to be somewhat related to a waste removal type of organ. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll refer to them sort of as a modified type of nephridia. And these are going to be found at the base of the legs, which again, as we had said, are also going to be used to remove waste. Now the sensory system of um, this particular order of arachnids is pretty straightforward. Oftentimes when you think about spiders, you think about spiders as having many eyes. And most spiders do have eight very simple eyes. And they're primarily used to detect movement or form some simple images. But one of the big things that they're going to use to actually sense their environment is going to be their sensory setae. Now remember the setae is going to be those very, very tiny bristles we had learned about back when we talked about the annelids. And what they can do with this is they can actually use these bristles to detect air currents, vibrations in their environment, and any other physical type of stimuli. Now as we had said, when you talk about spiders, of course, they have a very elaborate type of um, web spinning mechanism. Now most spiders will have between two or three pairs of spinnerets and these are going to contain the silk glands and when they actually produce the silk it actually is secreted as a liquid scleroprotein. All right and so we're talking about a protein type of material and once it makes contact with the air that's when the material is going to harden and form the typical web that we would recognize in the environment. Now these silk threads are going to be extremely strong and they can stretch extremely well. And this silk is going to be used for various different types of reasons. Um, they could be used of course to build webs and there's lots of different types of webs out there. They could use it to line burrows. For example the tarantula in my classroom. Um, it doesn't really build a web but it does line its burrow with the silk. It's going to form egg sacs to help protect the young and also of course once it does um, trap prey it's going to use it to wrap up its prey and maybe store it for later use. Now reproduction in this particular order of arachnids can be pretty sophisticated in some species. Oftentimes before mating the male is going to store up his sperm in the pedipalps and if it is a particular species where courtship is pretty elaborate the mating could possibly involve some sort of courtship ritual before he actually inserts his pedipalps into the female's genital openings. Now the eggs may develop in a cocoon or in a web or they could actually be physically carried by the female. Now the young are going to hatch in about two weeks and many of them will actually molt before they leave that egg cocoon. Now another order of arachnids we need to look at is the order Scorpionidae and this is going to be the scorpions and these are most common in tropical and subtropical zones but they can occur in temperate areas like our area for example as well. Now, there are approximately 1,400 species worldwide of scorpions. They are primarily nocturnal and they feed largely on insects and spiders. Now there are sand dwelling types of scorpions and what they do is they actually locate their prey by detecting surface waves with what we call leg sensile. Now we've used that term sensile before and what it means is simply a hair-like sensory structure. Now the appendages are going to be attached to the cephalothorax and so again if you look over here on the right you can see a good representation of a scorpion and it's really easy to tell where these appendages are attached. So this is going to be the area called the cephalothorax and this is going to be the abdominal region of the animal. They're going to have a pair of medial eyes and two to five lateral eyes and so there's going to be eyes basically um, medial which means kind of towards the center and then of course some eyes to the right and to the left of that line. 
Now the pre-abdomen is going to have seven segments and the post-abdomen is going to have a very long slender tail of five segments that's going to end in a stinging apparatus. Now under the abdomen are going to be comb-like pectines and these are going to be used to explore the ground and simply aid in sex recognition between the different scorpions. Now the stinger of course is what we oftentimes will recognize on a scorpion and this is going to be on the last segment of the animal's abdominal region and of course it does have venom and it's going to vary from a very mild venom to possibly a very dangerous type of venom. Sometimes people refer to the um, largest um, scorpions as having the mildest venom and the smaller ones being the ones you really need to watch out for. Now these animals tend to be either ovoviviparous or viviparous and they produce between 6 and 90 young. So what we need to do is we need to make sure we recall the difference between these two words. Now we've used ovoviviparous in the past. Now remember ovoviviparous simply means keeping the eggs inside of the female. She gives birth to live young but as we know they hatch on the inside and there's really no connection between the mother and the young. Now if you're talking about a viviparous type of um, reproduction, now that's a little bit different. This actually means that you have a connection between the mother and the offspring. So she's providing some sort of nutrients to that young before they actually are born. Now some of these animals will perform some pretty complex mating dances and in fact in some species the male will actually sting the female in the pedipalp or on the edge of the cephalothorax in a way to make sure that she recognizes him as a potential suitor when it comes down to reproduction. Now the last group of arachnids we're going to look at, and we're just going to go over this really, really quick, is going to be the ticks and the mites. There's about 30,000 species that have been described so far with ticks and mites. They can be both aquatic and terrestrial, and they can inhabit deserts, polar areas, and hot springs. So where you will find these animals is going to be pretty varied. Most mites are going to be less than one millimeter long. So these are pretty, pretty tiny arachnids. The ticks can range up to, though, two centimeters. So they're definitely one of the larger members of this particular group. Now this is going to be the order a carry, and I forgot to mention that when we first started this. Now they do have a complete fusion between the cephalothorax and the abdominal region. And so sometimes what they'll do is they'll refer to this entire area as the dorsal shield. And so that's definitely different from the scorpions and definitely different from the spiders that we had looked at previously. There is no sign of external segmentation in these animals. Now the clicer on each side is going to help the animal to pierce, tear, or grip food. Oftentimes when you talk about mites and ticks, we talk about them as being what we call temporary parasites, which means that they're going to spend a brief period of time on their host. And, and as we had said before, when it comes down to arachnids, they tend to um, suck the fluid from their prey. Now the other mouth parts are going to include the pedipalps, as we had seen in the previous two groups, with a fused base. They're going to have something called a hypostome, a rostrum, and then something called a tectum. So these are a couple of additional um, parts that we see in the mouth region of these animals that we didn't see in the spiders and we definitely didn't see in the scorpions. Now to continue, adult mites and ticks are going to possess four pairs of legs just like the spiders, just like the scorpions. They're going to transfer sperm directly to their mate or they're going to use spermatophores. Again, a spermatophore is simply a packet of sperm and the egg is going to hatch releasing a six-legged larvae form and eight-legged nymphal stages are going to follow after this. So there's definitely going to be a little bit of a difference between that newly hatched larvae and what you're going to see a little bit later on. So that's going to finish up this second screencast for chapter 19. Now remember, as before, please make sure that you've completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.